Hello, and welcome to episode two of From Zero to Zeta. I'm your host, Rowan McKee. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's here, shout out to CSU East Bay, where I earned my bachelor's and master's deg degrees in mathematics. I spent most of my adult life teaching people of all ages and from all walks of life the beauty of mathematics. And today, I'm here to share that beauty with you. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on your way in, and let's dive in. In our last episode, uh, linked here, we explored how mathematicians think using a well-known sliding tile puzzle. We saw that the rules of the puzzle gave rise to a structured system, a set of board states, and a way to transform one into another. From that, we identified three key ideas, identity, reversibility, and composability. Those ideas show up in more than just puzzles. They're a part of how math organizes its thinking. Today we're going to go deeper what happens when we try to de describe systems like that with complete precision. That's where axiomatization comes in. Axiomatization, the process of writing down the foundational rules of a system, is one of the most powerful tools in mathematics. Today mathematicians like to explore when one or more axioms are changed in some way or are removed entirely. but in ancient Greece, axioms were seen as self-evident truths. You didn't question them, you started from them. The most famous example, Euclid's Elements. Written around 300 BCE, it begins not with theorems, but with definitions and axioms. From those foundations, Euclid builds an entire universe of geometric results. This method of reasoning, start with unshakable truths and build from there, dominated Western mathematics for centuries. For over 2,000 years, this remained the gold standard of math, start from truths, reason forward. But in the 19th century, something changed. Mathematicians like Lobachevsky, Bolyai, and Riemann started asking, what if the axioms aren't true? What if they're not universal laws of space, but arbitrary assumptions that we choose to model different kinds of systems? The shift from treating axioms as truths to treating them as starting assumptions unlocked entirely new fields of mathematics. It was the beginning of formalism in mathematics, the realization that math could explore not just the world that is, but the worlds that could be. And that realization prepared the way for everything that came after. Non-Euclidean geometry, anything not in a flat plane, modern logic, set theory, and ultimately the abstract structures we'll explore throughout this series. Let's look at Euclid's five postulates. Not just list them, but try to understand what each one is asserting about space and structure. The first axiom is a, a straight line can be drawn between any two points. This means that space is connected and well behaved. If you have two distinct points, there exists exactly one straight line between them. This axiom forms a basis for defining the simplest geometric object, the line segment. The second axiom is a finite straight line can be extended indefinitely. This tells us that lines don't have natural boundaries. If you have a segment, you can always continue it forward, forward or backward, to form an infinitely long line. The third axiom is a circle can be drawn with any center and any radius. This assumes that distance is well defined. Given a point, the center, and a length, the radius, there exists a set of all points that are um, that fixed distance away, a circle. The fourth axiom is all right angles are equal to one another. This axiom says that right angles are consistent across space. A 90 degree angle formed here is the same as one formed anywhere else. It gives geometry a kind of angular uniformity. The fifth axiom um, is a bit wordier. So it says, given a line and a point not on that line, there is exactly one line parallel to the given line that passes through the point. This is the famous parallel postulate. It tells us something very specific about how lines behave in relation to each other. In a flat Euclidean world, only one line through a point can run parallel to a given line. As we'll see, alternate 
altering just this postulate leads to radically different geometries. That last one, the parallel postulate, is the strange one. It's longer, less intuitive, and for centuries people tried to prove it using the first four. No one succeeded. Eventually someone asked, what if we change it? So let's explore what happens when we change just one axiom the Euclid's fifth postulate, the parallel postulate. In Euclidean ge geometry, through a point not on a line, there is exactly one line that does not intersect the original line. In other words, exactly one parallel line. This describes a familiar flat geometry most of us learn in school, where space is level and parallel lines never touch, no matter how far you extend them. Now, let's see what happens in a different world. In hyperbolic geometry, the fifth postulate is replaced. It says, through a point not on a line, there are infinitely many lines that never intersect the original line. This may look strange, but it's entirely consistent, just in a di different kind of space. And from this one change, major consequences unfold. Triangle angle sums are less than 180 degrees. The larger the triangle, the smaller the sum. Parallelism becomes non-unique. You can have asymptotically parallel lines and diverging lines that never meet. Circles grow faster than in Euclidean space. The area of a circle increases exponentially with its radius. And straight lines curve. They're no longer straight in the Euclidean sense, but they still behave consistently as shortest paths in that geometry. This one change created hyper hyperbolic geometry, a whole new kind of space, space with its own internal logic. And it's not just abstract. Hyperbolic geometry appears in models of space-time and general re relativity, in complex analysis, and even in modern art and architecture. So, from just a single tweak to a single axiom, we get a completely different mathematical universe. Equally valid, equally beautiful. However, not all axioms change space. Some change our way of thinking about the space. The axiom of choice states Given any collection of non-empty sets, it is possible to choose exactly one element from each set, even if the collection is infinite, and even if there's no explicit rule for how to make those choices. So you can think of a bunch of boxes, even an infinitely long list of boxes. It's intuitive that you should be able to reach into uh, those boxes, assuming they are not empty, and pull something out. Um, and at first glance, this seems harmless, even obvious. If every set has at least one element, why shouldn't we be able to pick one? And for centuries, mathematicians did just that, implicitly using choice without acknowledging it. For example, selecting one element from each set in a countable collection of non-empty sets. Um, constructing a basis for a vector space, even infinite ones and choosing representatives from equivalence classes. But in 1904, Ernst Zermelo attempted to prove the well-ordering theorem, the statement that every set can be well-ordered, meaning every subset has at least a least element. To make his proof work, he had to assume something not provable from existing axioms, the axiom of choice. That moment formalized the axiom of choice as a distinct assumption, and it split the mathematical world. Okay, wait. So if it's so obvious, why the controversy? Because the axiom of choice allows for existence without construction. It says something exists without proving, providing a method to find it, and once you attempt that, you get consequences that are mathematically consistent but deeply unintuitive. If the axiom of choice is accepted, every vector space has a basis, even uncountable ones like function spaces. Um, this is essential in linear algebra, functional analysis, and quantum mechanics. Um, Tychonoff's theorem holds a cornerstone in topology stating that any product of compact spaces is com compact. Zorn's lemma and the well-ordering theorem um, 
equivalent to each other are provable um, and are both logically equivalent to the axiom of choice. Um, these results power much of modern pure mathematics, especially in algebra analysis and topology. But accepting the axiom of choice also leads to strange outcomes. There's something called the Banach-Tarski paradox, where you get a solid sphere in three-dimensional space that can be split into a finite number of pieces and reassembled into two identical copies of the original. No volume is lost or added. This violates our physical intuition, but is mathematically valid under the axiom of choice. And a number of non-measurable sets, there exist subsets of the real numbers to which no consistent notion of length can be assigned. For example, the Cantor set. And choice functions exist without being definable. Um, so you can assert the existence of functions with no way to describe them. And in fact, most of the functions that are out there are undefinable. Um, however, because they are undefinable, we can only really work, when, work with the ones that are definable, right? Now, these outcomes don't break math. They just challenge our sense of reality. They show that logic alone can take us to places that feel paradoxical. If the axiom of choice is rejected, however, many theorems become unprovable or require restatement. There exist vector spaces without a basis, and infinite products of compact spaces may not be compact. Constructive methods take priority. You can only assert what you can build. This approach appears, appeals to constructivists and intuitionists, mathematicians who believe math should be grounded in objects who we can explicitly construct and verify. Most modern, modern mathematicians work in a system called ZFC, which stands for zermelo frankel Set Theory with the Axiom of Choice. It's powerful, general, and convenient. But foundational researchers, logicians, and computer scientists often study what happens when you remove the Axiom of Choice, leading to alternate systems and new questions. So the Axiom of Choice isn't just a tool, it's a lens through which we understand what math is allowed to be draws the line between proof and construction, between existence and method, between mathematical freedom and mathematical discipline. Now, how do we use these? Mathematicians don't just use axioms to state assumptions. They use them to build worlds. Once a set of axioms is chosen, everything else in that mathematical universe must follow logically from those starting rules. This gives us a structure called an axiomatic system. An axiomatic system isn't just a philosophical statement, it's a working framework, the blueprint for constructing entire branches of mathematics. Let's look at a few examples. Euclidean geometry starts with Euclid's five postulates and builds thousands of years of theorems about triangles, circles, shapes, much of which we still teach in today's school. Piano arithmetic begins with axioms about zero, successors, and addition, and leads to all of the arithmetic you learned in grade school. ZFC set theory is the modern foundation for most of mathematics, defining sets, mem membership, and how collections of objects interact. Group theory, which we'll start exploring in the next episode, uses only a handful of axioms, but those rules model everything from number systems to symmetries to permutations. So why go through the trouble of axiomatizing everything? Because when you do, you gain precision, you know exactly what you're assuming. Consistency, you can prove that your results don't contradict each other. Transferability, you can apply the same logic in different settings. And generativity, you can explore consequences, find new structures, and prove new theorems, all from the rules you started with. This is where axiomatization becomes more than philosophy, becomes a method of exploration. And it's this idea of defining a system and then exploring its consequences that leads directly into the study of abstract algebra. That's where we're heading next. So, to wrap up, axioms define the world. Changing one can change everything. We build systems from axioms and explore their consequences. Next time, we'll start working inside one of those systems. We'll define our first structure in abstract algebra, the group. And groups show up in numbers, symmetries, transformations, and more. If you watched episode one, you've already seen their shadow. 
In episode 3, we'll shine a light on what groups are and how mathematicians use them to model structure itself. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Uh, take a look at these exercises if you're interested in thinking about this some more, and make sure to hit that subscribe button on your way out. Uh, so, let's end with some exercises you can try at home. Try to describe the arithmetic system you, le you learned for real numbers growing up using a set of axioms. What properties and structures do they have? Start by writing down all of the rules you can think of or remember. Next, determine if any of them are redundant. Can you prove any from the others? Compare your results with the standard axioms for the real numbers. Now change or remove one of the axioms. What kind of system do you end up with? Leave your answers in the comments or bring them uh, to the next video. Let's, let's build this channel together. Thank you.